Hi, and welcome to this live reading from The Wicked Wolves of Windsor and Other Fairy Tales by Bert Nash, and this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Milking Time Bess was milking her favorite cow as her stepmother entered the barn and asked her to kill a sorcerer. She continued the squeezing rhythm, enjoying the satisfying sound of the liquid stream hitting the tin of the pail. The barn was filled with the low murmur of contented farm animals. The early morning was usually the, best, the time of the day she liked best, most, mostly because she could be private before her family awoke. Did you hear me? Her stepmother demanded. Being a short woman, the cow blocked her from seeing the girl's exasperated countenance. Bess stood up, putting aside pail and stool. She returned the cow to its pen, letting the calf finish off whatever milk was left. She hooked the gate latch, retrieved the milk bucket, and headed back toward the house. Her stepmother broke into a trot to keep up with the girl's stride, their long dresses whipping behind them. Why can't Annie do it? She finally replied. You know how she is about blood protested her stepmother. Remember what happened at the last fall butchering? Her ever-practical stepmother did have a point, admitted Bess. Her half-sister Annie had never really taken to farm life, and its realities of growing, harvesting, and dying. She pondered the request while she fitted the top of the stoneware jar with a straining cloth. While Bess poured the milk, her stepmother tapped her foot impatiently. What's he done that requires killing? He's been winning at cards, cards, dice, you name it, taking the hard-earned pay from the farmers that thought as thoughtlessly as a child plucks a summer daisy. Bess felt no sympathy. She hadn't forgotten how, after father's death, their neighbors had gossiped the land would now sell cheaply. But we didn't sell, the girl thought with grim satisfaction. Bess looked down on hands that were no longer soft and white, but were calloused and red-chapped, and replied in a mild tone. Maybe they should be going home instead of swilling ale at the Pipers. Annie's young man, Trevor, is one of those farmers. He could lose the wedding dowry his father gave him, her stepmother said, adding mournfully, if he hasn't already. In the gloom of the root cellar, Bess said nothing aloud about this potential for catastrophe. Neither of them cared for the match between Annie and Trevor, probably because he was the type who would wager his bridal savings with a stranger at a local posting inn. I'll go in this evening and see for myself. Her stepmother smiled, patting Bess's arm. I knew you'd take care of it. When his city business had failed, her father brought his family to the country. From the windows of their hired coach, all Bess saw was a dark, small cottage and a falling down barn. Seeking reassurance, the young girl had turned helplessly to her stepmother. There she found only blank horror on the woman's face. It took three years before father's dream of a pastoral paradise finally wore out his heart with life's reality. Sent to the fields to bring him lunch, Bess had discovered his corpse in the dirt behind the plow, a patient farm horse standing still in his traces. Country life had already taught Bess that work couldn't be left unfinished. Carefully stepping over her father's body, she completed the furrow. Afterwards, she brought him home across the back of the horse where he was greeted by the wails of his wife and youngest daughter. In the face of this calamity, her stepmother proved smarter than her husband by immediately admitting she knew no nothing about farming. Instead of trying to manage the land, she turned the farm over to Bess who had already shown aptitude and interest. For herself, she said, ladies will be tired of dullness, predicting that a market for fine goods would soon flourish since the war with Napoleon had ended. Her stepmother's prophecy came true as the fancy, fancy work she had taken to town was appreciated and, and admired. It seemed city ladies were ready to spend their coin on beautiful things to decorate themselves and their homes. With a growing demand for her work, her stepmother taught her needlework skills to her daughter Annie, who proved an eager pupil. Recently turned 16, Annie much preferred the genteel picture of sitting at a window in a fresh clean dress, plying a needle rather than feeding chickens, 
and milking cows. Amusements were thin, and so just a few months before settled about a winter's fire, Annie had proposed a wager to Bess. She suggested they see who would be first to draw a husband to their door. They paid no heed to their mother's statement that to marry in haste was to repent at leisure. Willing to do anything to alleviate the tedium, Bess agreed, and the girls shook on the deal. With whispered secrets and giggles, the cold weeks flew faster now. Poppets were quickly, quickly hidden under the pillows if Mother ventured by their shared room. When Trevor arrived at the farm, looking for a lost hunting dog, the three women exchanged knowing looks behind his back. They welcomed the tired traveler to their table for a bite of supper. He was served off their fine city dishes, one of the few things saved from their creditors, and given the choicest piece of meat. Annie shot Bess a triumphant look across the table. What passed for a village lay a distance of five miles from the farm, which gave Bess plenty of time to think about her sister's suitor. Trevor, muttered Bess darkly to herself. Her stride grew faster in response to her inner agitation. No other man had arrived to court, so Annie's, Annie's cutting work was declared the winner. Still, Bess did not envy her half-sister her choice, for not only was Trevor a poor catch being a second son, but Bess thought him without integrity. Her dismal thinking almost caused the girl to miss the turn toward the village at the crossroads. Catching herself in time, Bess stopped and looked about to make sure no one was in view. To work the glamour that her stepmother insisted she wear, Bess spat on her fingers and drew a quick sigil on the center of her forehead, the wrists of her arms, and the toes of her boots. Turning clockwise, she pulled down the glamour over her face and form, changing her appearance. Settled into her new skin, Bess braced her shoulders and took a step forward. Time to take the measure of this spellcaster's medal. The Piper was an old building of thick timber and stone in a Tudor style. Its size often made the villagers brag that it must have been an old manor house, perhaps once owned by Squire Ackerman's family. In her former town life, Bess had once seen the squire's mighty fine house and estate. She doubted that a man with real glass windows would have called the Piper home. Regardless of his past glory, today it served the needs of travelers and tradesmen going through to the large city beyond. But what the inn really did best was ladle out gossip to its patrons. As Bess approached the building, a group of laborers stood on the stoop blocking the doorway. They re their refusal to give full way forced the girl to squeeze through them to gain entrance. It was an intimidation game that Bess usually avoided by going around to the back door. Today, feeling irritated by their boorish behavior, she used her powers to give one a discreet electric shock. Bess hid a smile as he cursed, spilling his tankard. The Piper's current owners were Stoney and Maggie Tolliver. Townbred like Bess and her family, they had owned the inn only a few years, and so were still viewed suspiciously as newcomers. Stoney was at the counter, working the bar. He was a former sailor, a small, dark-haired, wiry man, who moved with quick, quick grace as he served the crowd their drinks. "'You want Meg's?' he asked her and tossed his head back, nodding behind him. "'She'll be in the kitchen.' The outdoor kitchen was behind the inn in the former courtyard enclosure with four stone walls higher than Bess's head. During the summer months, extra tables and benches would be set up for weddings and funerals, as the area was quite large. A set of buildings along the perimeter that had once been stables now housed chickens, ducks, and a sow named Grandella. Bess found Maggie pulling fresh bread loaves out of a dome-shaped oven using a long paddleboard. Each loaf was placed into a basket and the smell of the fine bread made the girl's mouth water. Maggie was dark like her husband and her face was flushed from the heat of the oven. In her exertion, strands of her black hair had escaped from under her cap and now blew in front of her eyes. Oh, Megs cried out in surprise when she finally noticed Bess. She laughed self-consciously before adding, You're the answer to a prayer. There's too many dining tonight for Stoney and me to handle. Can you help us out? Bess had not lived three years in abject poverty to not know the value of her behavior. The value of her labor. She had already noticed the Piper's famous sow was suckling a new batch of family members. 
Brandella produced exceptional offspring of the highest quality, and many trophies displayed in the inn's great room stood as proof that Stoney's breeding had merit. I can help in exchange for a piglet from Grant's letter. Now, that's a bit much for one night's work, Meg began Meg's, narrowing her eyes. She also knew the value of Grandella's farrow. I'll give you five days of work, including sweeping, mopping, laundry, and making beds. Bess emphasized each task by unfolding a finger on her hand. And I'll settle for, settle for the runt. She'll kill him anyway. Well, you'll have to agree on the number of work days with Stoney, but I am that desperate for the help, conceded Maggie. Men! Men don't realize everything that needs doing. Ready to earn herself a piglet, Bess grabbed up the baskets to take back inside. Working side by side with Maggie they made Bess realize the truth of her friend's comment. Stoney stayed at the bar throughout the evening, talking and spinning tales, picking up coins to put in the metal box kept under the counter. Meanwhile, the two women cooked the dinners, cut bread and cheese, carried, carried serving trays, and collected the dirty dishes. The cycle of serving, collecting, and washing never seemed to end. However, her work let Bess ask questions about, without being obvious about her real interest. Why so busy tonight? It's been getting busier every night since that man came ten days ago, grumbled Maggie. She quickly added, forcing a more cheer cheerful tone to her words that rang rather falsely. But that's been good for business. I heard something about that. I'm sure your mother has heard all about him, confided Mags, always ready for gossip. That no good Trevor has been in every night this week. He's been mewing after that man like a toddler refusing to be weaned. Bess never thought it a good policy to criticize family or soon-to-be family to others, so she just shrugged. Amy and he haven't posted the bands yet, so the coin is his own. Maggie clucked like one of her hens as she used tongs to pull drumsticks out from the cast iron pan. He's not the only one here spending his coin as if he was the country squire, so perhaps I'm being too harsh. They do love to be entertained by our guest. Oh, so the man is an entertainer. Maggie gave a snort, coupled with raised eyebrows. He's an entertainment of some sort. You'll see. Bess was stacking dishes from the tables onto a tray so her back was to the staircase when the general chatter of the room suddenly quieted. Bess moved to stand in the front hall of alcove so she was half sheltered by wall and drapery. From her position, she could view the stranger unobserved. The newcomer was enormously fat, a huge man that topped her own beanpole height by at least two hands. His labored breathing was raspy, and the oak stair risers groaned under his weight as he came down them. He was dressed in the height of finery with tailored clothes, and on each of his fat fingers was a ring of gold, holding a colored stone. From his vest chain dangled a crystal fob the size of a pigeon's egg. By the time he was four steps short of the landing, the dining room had become oppressively silent, as if royalty or a two-headed goat had come among them. He looked expensive and rich. He had presents. He reeked of sorcery. Bess bit her own thumbnail as she watched the power of the man's glamour rise like steam from a pile of cow dung on a cold day. The foggy wisps moved away from him to hover over the heads of those who he passed. The stranger greeted many by name as he moved among them, clasping hands and tapping shoulders. His jovial remarks invited them into an intimate circle of friendship while they unknowingly inhaled the invisible smoke of his magic. One man jumped up from his seat to wave the sorcerer over to his bench, telling him he had saved a spot for him. Bess pursed her lips in aggravation as she recognized the fool as Trevor. Dumb as that cockerel who refused to stop crowing last summer. The only way to shut that rooster up had been to kill him. In disgust, she cleaned her hands on the towel hanging at her waist before she lifted up the heavy tray to head back to the kitchen. She had seen enough. Mother was right. The sorcerer needs to go. Best do it now, advised Maggie with her arms plunged up to her elbows in hot soapy water as she washed plates. Now, repeated Bess puzzled. As part of their agreement, one of Bess's tasks was to clean the bedrooms of the guests staying at the Piper. However, with so many dishes still to do, surely Maggie could use her help in the kitchen. He never leaves his room unless it's to gamble with them, explained the innkeeper. He's already been down at least an hour, so nip upstairs and do what needs doing. 
sensing the girl's reluctance, Maggie added. That is, if you want that piglet. The runt's a girl this time. The room smelled of the heavy musk of male magic. Despite the evening chill, Bess opened the bottle glass window and breathed in the fresh air. The lodger's room was at the back of the building and thus gave a good view of the courtyard. It gave Bess ideas, but for now, she had work to get done. <laughs>